got it going. Good morning, and welcome to St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. I am Reverend Corey Alexander Willette, and it is my joy to be the pastor here at St. B's. 
a few announcements this morning. First is that Mary Devers passed away this week on Thursday. She, we, there will be, her service will be on this Wednesday, July 6th at 2 p.m. at Sykes Funeral Home. Burial will follow at Greenwood. There will also be a visitation on Tuesday night, July 5th from 4 to 7 and again on Wednesday from noon until the time of the service. Going around the sanctuary is a sign-up sheet if you would like to provide a gift. We will be having a dinner here at the church after the service on Wednesday. Secondly, Anne's closet is, in, is still in need of spaghetti noodles, spaghetti sauce, and macaroni and cheese. If you are able to bring those donations this week, Anne's closet will be open on Wednesday from 11 to 1. July 4th, we are still planning on gathering tomorrow for our 4th of July cookout and fireworks. We will very carefully shoot fireworks and have emergency water on hand because we know that things are still quite dry. Uh, but you are invited to bring your favorite dessert, chips, and drinks, and also fireworks if you so choose. It also would not be a bad idea to bring a lawn chair if you would like to sit at any point during the fireworks show. Our back to school bash is August 6th, and we are already in the planning process for that, and so if you would like to donate money or unused new school supplies, um, we would be deeply appreciative as we will be providing not only backpacks and school supplies, but also all sorts of fun games and inflatables, and possibly snow cones. So please consider making a donation to, for that event so that we can celebrate our, the children in our community. Also, please fill out the attendance pad at the end of your queue so that we know that you were in worship with us today. Most importantly, I want you to know that whether this is your first time or you have been attending for years, whether you're strong in your faith or you still have some questions, no matter your age, your tax bracket, your ability, or the color of your skin, no matter who you love or who loves you, you are welcome here. I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. Praise be to God who has freed us from oppression. Praise be to God who has healed our wounded souls. Let our hearts rejoice at God's redeeming love. Let our voices raise in song of thanksgiving for all that God is doing for us. Come, let us worship the Lord with our whole hearts. May our praise and voices resound with joy. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we sing together our opening hymn. Hymn number 365, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. <laughs> Yeah. 
we affirm our faith together through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sent at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. mercies and fierce challenges. It can be disorienting to be your people. You turn our mourning into dancing. Then you send us forth like lambs into the midst of wolves. You turn our weeping into shouts of joy. Then you charge us to seek the welfare of those who have abused and betrayed us. You turn our scarcity into overflowing abundance. Then you instruct us to leave it all behind and seek those who have gone astray. Help us question our deeply held assumptions and challenges, our unconscious convictions. Grant us the courage to speak Christ's word of, speak, of peace and to share Christ's word of comfort. The kingdom of God has come near. Amen. You may remain in your seats as we sing together hymn number 605, Wash, O God, Our Sons and Daughters. <laughs>
Our scripture today comes from 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Abram, was a great man and in high favor with his master. Because of him, the Lord had given victory to Abram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel. She served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went, went in and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter of the king of his, to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry, and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out, and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and would wave his hand over the spot, and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Pharpha, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servant approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, be to God. When I was in seminary, I was working at a church in Midtown, Atlanta, located on the corner of Ponce de Leon and Charles Allen. At the corner stood a large cross made from old railroad tracks. For the congregation, it stood as a welcome to the rest of the community. During my time at the church, we began engaging in deep conversation with our community. We wanted to start a children's program for the kids in the community, and we wanted community participation in it. As we were engaging in these conversations, we learned something different about the cross that stood at the corner of Ponce and Charles Allen. It was not the welcoming sign we thought it was. Instead, it was a sign that told our black neighbors that they should not cross the road there because they would absolutely not be welcome. 
You see, Ponce de Leon Avenue runs east to west and historically was a divided line for Atlanta. North of Ponce is the safe side. It's the wealthy side, the white side. South of Ponce is the dangerous side. It's the side with subsidized housing. It's the black side. In the Great Atlanta Fire of 1970, the original church building burned, and they were trying to decide where to rebuild their church. The original church was on the south side of Ponce. The congregation decided to rebuild on the north side. In learning that the cross on the corner, that which the congregation was immensely proud, was actually a dividing line, we had to look deeply at ourselves and listen to the voices that had long been ignored. We had to hear the voices of the unnamed who had been affected by the actions taken by the church. We had to be willing to accept that we needed to humbly extend a hand of healing and also accept the hand that was reaching out to us. One of the steps in this long process was an intentional day of prayer at the church. We prayed for our community. We prayed for our church. We prayed for a new song to be sung in the space so that we might truly address the places where we had fallen short of the kingdom of God. We prayed that we might be open to receive different traditions from our own so that we might be transformed by God. As we prayed, the son of one of the security officers who worked in the building joined us. Andre and I walked through each of the prayer stations together. But at one point, he broke off on his own. He was at the station where we were writing our hopes for the new song on post-it notes that were shaped like music notes. And we were humbled. All who were in the building were humbled as we listened to his voice echoing through the sanctuary. As he began singing the words that each of us had written on these notes. This morning we hear the story of Naaman. He is a great commander in the army of the king of Ammon. And his troops have, been de have defeated the Israelites in a great victory given to them by the Lord. The defeat given by the Lord of Israel seems counterintuitive. But attributing an Israelite's defeat to the Lord is commonplace in Israelite theology because in Israelite theology, no foreign army can be victorious over them unless it is the will of God. And in this story, their defeat is necessary because it would result in the conversion of a powerful Gentile and the glorification of the Lord. But Naaman is not the only character in our story today. There are several other important characters, though they are easy to dismiss as we never learn their names. After we learn of Naaman's condition, we hear from a slave girl who has been taken captive from Israel and now serves Naaman's wife. She says to Naaman's wife, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. We know the horrors of slavery especially when we look critically at our own country. 
We know the lasting effects it has on our black siblings as our black siblings carry generational trauma with them from the era of slavery here. We continue to see the ways in which the Jim Crow era of segregation and racism continue to affect our society. We see the ways in which black Americans cannot trace their lineage because of the human trafficking that occurred during slavery. We have seen the ways that black Americans were viewed as non-persons, persons who did not experience pain, persons who do not deserve the same rights, persons who only need to exist when they are useful to someone in power persons who have been unnamed. Yet this unnamed Israelite girl shared with Naaman the good news that there would be relief for his suffering. She was strong enough to embrace and make use of the traditions of her nation while a slave in a foreign land in which she is a cultural and religious outsider. She is under no responsibility to do so. And it is important that we recognize that slaves should not be expected to help their masters in this way, as they have been stripped of their rights and dignity. But she does share her traditions with Naaman which results in his willingness to seek help from a theology and culture that was different from his own. As Naaman journeys to Israel for his cure, he is expecting something grand. The king of Amman has sent him with tremendous gifts of wealth and status and a letter requesting that Naaman be healed in the land of Israel. The king of Israel is reasonably angry and confused by this request, calling out, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha hears of the king's dismay, he sends word, instructing the king to send Naaman to him so that he might affirm and prove his status as a prophet in Israel. When Naaman arrives at Elisha's house, he's surprised and offended that Elisha would not come out to heal him himself. Instead, we see another unnamed messenger who instructs Naaman to go and wash seven times in the Jordan River so that his flesh will be restored. Naaman leaves angry. Why was he being given instruction to go and bathe in the dinky Jordan River instead of a mighty river of Damascus? Why would he, a great general, be slighted like this by Elisha, who couldn't even bother to talk directly to Naaman himself? Why couldn't Elisha just come out of his house and wave his hand and instantly cure Naaman. Doesn't Elisha know how much wealth and status Naaman brings with him wherever he goes? We then find Naaman's servants attempting to ease his rage. They attempt to reason with him. They attempt to show him that just because the reality didn't meet his expectation, it doesn't mean there isn't power and restoration that can come through what he was told by Elisha's messenger. When Naaman finally submits to the instructions given to him by Elisha, he finds himself fully restored. He is no longer suffering from the physical and societal effects of his leprosy. Throughout this story, 
we witness unnamed slaves and servants extend a humble hand of healing and grace so that Naaman might be restored by God. We watch as God works through each of the unnamed, challenging Naaman's understanding and disrespect of race, culture, and religion. We watch as the unnamed slave girl draws on her own religious and cultural resources, unwilling to put them aside for a diplomatic solution. As we continue to live in a country that is defined by its division, we struggle to find common ground within our cultural and religious beliefs and understanding. The solution to these differences is not to ignore our traditions in search of neutral ground. The solution is to stand firm in our traditions with an openness to experience and learn from the traditions of those that are different from our own. Our beliefs and traditions should never be a hindrance to the work that God is doing in our lives, in our community, in our nation, in our world. In order to learn from these differences, we must be open and willing to hear the new song that is being sung by those voices who have been silenced and ignored. We must be open and willing to be the recipients of things that feel foreign and strange to us. Because we find in this story that this story is a story of God working through and in spite of people with different traditions and beliefs and cultures. We see God working beyond the dividing lines we have set up and it invites us into restoration. We see God working in the seemingly simple to bring about substantial transformation. In this story, we see God. And all of God's power is on display. And so may our eyes continue to be open to the unending work of God around us. And may we know that sometimes that work is not a grand display, but simple instruction if we are willing to follow. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers forward for this morning's offering. God, pour your spirit upon us and these our gifts. Gifts that you have graciously given to us that we now humbly return to you so that your kingdom on earth might be realized regardless of our beliefs and traditions and cultures, but that in all things you are working in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
As we come to our time of prayer this morning, we have a few prayer requests to lift up. First, we want to keep in our prayers the family of Leela Ham. Leela passed away last Sunday and her service was this past week. We also want to keep in our prayers the family of Mary Devers, who passed away on Wednesday of this week. We also want to Keep in our prayers, Lucille Thompson, who fell last week and broke her leg and had surgery. She is in rehab and is recovering well. Also, we want to remember Diane Austin, who had surgery on her foot at the end of last week. So, we keep all of them in our prayers. Are there other joys or concerns that we would like to lift up this morning? Seeing them, let us go to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, for the ability and the opportunity to gather once more to worship your holy name. Oh God, we lift up to you all of the prayers we have made. Prayers in the midst of grief and loss. Prayers in the midst of healing. Prayers that remain deep within our hearts. Prayers that are unready to be spoken aloud. O oh God, you have heard each and every one of them. You pour your spirit upon us so that we might know your comfort and peace and healing. O oh God, we ask that you continue to make your presence known among us. that we might be receptive to see the places where you are working in us and through us. Oh God, we pray for ourselves and our community that restoration might be known. We pray for our nation and our world, that justice and freedom and peace may be known. Oh God, we pray all of these things in your Son's holy name.
as we come to our time of Holy Communion this morning, the, a few instructions. First is that when it is time to serve, I will invite the servers forward, and then the ushers will instruct the rest of the congregation forward, and you're invited to kneel at the altar, and, the, and our servers will bring you communion, and then I will dismiss you with a blessing. Any money that is left on the altar goes to our Helping Hands Fund, which goes to assist our community members in need. This is not my table. This is not St. Bethlehem's table. This is not the United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table. And at Christ's table, all are welcome. Period. There are no exceptions to who is welcome at this table. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. 
on the night in which he gave himself up for us. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By our spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in, the whole, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many partake in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is sharing in the blood of Christ. At this time, I invite those assisting with communion to come forward.
accept and you are invited. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. 
Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, I invite you to stand as you are able for our closing hymn. This is my song, hymn number 437. and understandings that are different than ours. And for that, we give thanks. We give thanks that this journey is not our own, but God's. God is working in us and through us to bring God's peace and hope and love and grace and kingdom to earth. And so, go in peace. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. Amen. Amen.